Thomas Jefferson said, a well-informed electorate is a prerequisite for democracy. The following program is part of the series, Influencers and Media Makers. A number of years ago, CCTV sat down with some of Vermont's most influential voices in media, news, and information access to understand their perspectives about the role of media in democracy and how their decisions shape the way we as Vermonters receive information. Much has changed since our first interviews. The people, the technology and social media, the political landscape, and so much more. Fast forward 20 or so years, and in collaboration with Leadership Champlain, we are revisiting the topic with a focus on what has changed, gaps and challenges across geographic, language, and socioeconomic boundaries. The conversations you will hear with today's gatekeepers provide important, varied, and insightful context to the media in Vermont today. Enjoy. Um, so thanks so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time to start with that. Um, so we have a couple of themes. Do we go over the themes? So we're going to look at, we're going to talk a little bit about um, democracy in the media, we're going to talk a little bit about the reach, and we're going to talk a little bit about demographics. And so we're going to start with democracy, and um, so we're exploring the evolving role of media and the necessity of an unfettered press in that democratic process. So just before we dive in, how do you respond to that in general as a topic? It won't surprise you that I am very pro-democracy, very uh, pro-voter participation, um, uh, active dialogue in the community, uh, engaged citizenry. I, I think everybody in the media is going to tell you the same thing. We are um, defenders of democracy and uh, about voter participation and about um, open dialogue, open meetings, um, robust dissemination of information. So from your perspective, how do people make voting decisions and where do they access that information about political decisions? I know you've got, we just were discussing kind of how things have evolved and changed and if you could talk a little bit about maybe when you started, how that process looked, how they accessed information in, in a democratic frame, in a voting frame, and where it is now. Well, I've been doing this a long time. Uh, uh, about four decades and it's evolved even in our state. I think Vermont has always been more engaged than most states I, because of our smallness. I think our, our town meeting tradition, I think we have long been engaged in civic discourse, politics. Uh, and you know, uh, I think we all uh, probably start out uh, sort of forming beliefs that mirror those of our friends, our parents, our families growing up, but you know, as we become adults, um, you know, hopefully you get uh, information that helps you form your views about public policy from a lot of sources. Um, I worry about that now. I mean, there is polling that indicates that depending upon you know your political view or your you know affiliated tribe you gravitate toward news sources that you perceive uh, that you agree with. And I, I think that's, that's uh, risky in a democracy. Um, here in Vermont, I think that's, uh, I, I'm sure that's, I'm sure we're not exceptional in that way, but I'd like to think that we are on a state and local level more engaged. Um, and there are some uh, discernible trends in media over the last well, over, over my years um, that, you know, are driven by technology and market forces. But, you know, I think we still have a pretty robust conversation in our state about um, issues of public policy, uh, which includes politicians and campaigns, but, but also about the direction that we want our state to, to go in. And as a media personality or a media professional, how do you counter that draw to go from one extreme to the other when you guys are deciding how to cover things politically specifically? Do you actively seek out each side or you, do you, is there a conscious decision to kind of stay down the, down the main road or? Well, we act, yes, we actively seek uh, both sides. Sometimes there are three sides. Uh, we try to be fair, particularly around campaign time. Uh, but you know, there are also 
Um, you know, there are fringe elements, uh, even in our state, uh, and um, that are not mainstream. And I guess we make decisions about whether they're credible or not, um, you know, and truthful. I mean, there's, an, uh, there's a difference between expressing an opinion that may be unpopular, and that's fine, but, um, but uh, disseminating misinformation is not helpful, and that's certainly not our role. And how has social media impacted the, that, in, specifically in political trends? Do you guys have your finger on the pulse of that, and does that impact what and how you report? We watch. Uh, we're mindful of, of social media. I do not, I'm not obsessed by it. I, I don't track it every day. That's not my, my role. Um, we have a digital team here that does, <laughs> and I tend to ask them for guidance about what's hot. Um, you know, we, I have younger colleagues who are much better at this stuff than I am. Um, but there's no question that social media has played a huge role in driving the national conversation. And um, I'm not sure that's been a great thing. I, I really don't. Because social media is a free-for-all. And you can hide, you know, often anonymously and, and say some pretty crazy stuff. Um, it's not to say that everything on social media is, is not true, but there's a lot that isn't. Right. And I think when you can hide behind a computer screen um, and say whatever you want, um, it, it's, it's all often not helpful to, you know, I, think, I think there is a direct correlation between social media and the intense polarization that we have in our country right now. Mm -hmm. Going back a little bit to access of information, that was one of the things that um, CCTV wanted us to focus on and kind of get an idea and a feel for. And from your perspective, do you have, um, do you have an idea of, of who has and who doesn't have access to information in Vermont, just kind of in general? Is that something you guys research or look into? Or, um, Well, access to information, that's kind of a broad what we do is is free and is widely available. I mean, I'm a broadcaster, which by definition means, you know, it has a wide reach. Uh, there's no subscription. Uh, so if you have a television, uh, you can get us. Um, there are There is some information that is uh, reserved behind a paywall. Uh, and, I, and I understand that, um, you know. I like to get paid. They like to get paid. Everybody sort of appreciates a paycheck at the end of the week. But, uh, you know, I sense that information is, is as readily available now than it has ever been, more so, uh, thanks to the, the uh, invention of and the popularity of the Internet. And, and in Vermont, we have, you know, all that I know of newspapers and television stations and certainly online news outlets are, have robust internet presence and are for the most part free of charge. So it's up to you whether you want to become informed or not. Uh, is there anything else that you want to comment on about um, democracy in the media and the media's role in that before we transition to another topic? The media in Vermont is sometimes criticized for um, not um, looking uh, and sounding as, as diverse as some would, would like us to be. Uh, I think the media in Vermont, uh, certainly, uh, we are making a very intentional effort to diversify, both in terms of what we put on television and, and the people who work here, um, to, to reach out to, to voices as our state becomes slowly but discernibly more diverse as, as we welcome refugees um, and encourage immigration and, and stuff. This is not the, the Vermont of, of the 1950s anymore. And um, we're making a real effort um, to have that reflected on what we put on television and uh, on the staff that produces our programming. This actually segues exactly into the next topic. Do you want me to keep going and then you can do your piece after instead of separating it? So. Um, so, well, we were talk we were discussing that kind of as a group, that multicultural aspect, mm -hmm. and um, 
when we think about who's being reached through traditional media and who is not, it raises the question of our multicultural populations, refugees, and immigrants in Vermont, with the expanding conversation around systemic racism, inclusion, and equality. So like you just addressed, uh, one of our questions, how, how are traditional media organizations working to reach and engage these and other communities that have more bar barriers to being civically engaged? So in addition to the diversity and inclusion that you talked about within your workforce here, is there more like outreach in the community or um, even like translations, uh, uh, you know, to make other, even not necessarily politically, but information in general available to those populations where English might not be a first language? Um, no. Okay. We, we don't offer translation services. Yep. Um, I, I'm not aware of a television station that does. I, I but, I, but I'm not. I'm just not sure. Um, but, but no, that's not something that we do. We make an, an effort to incorporate uh, minorities, um, and um, you, you know what? What I once had a journalism instructor refer to as purple people. And what he meant by that was, was not the same old voices that we tend to hear uh, over and over in media coverage, but people who are impacted by a policy choice, um, people who might feel on the uh, margin of, of a conversation or, or of a community, and, in, and include them. We have an ongoing series called Project Community, which is something that Hearst Television uh, has asked of all its stations across the country. And the idea there is to focus on people who are trying to uh, bring communities together uh, rather than um, focus on, on division and fracture. Um, and, and that extends to minority communities. We reach out to, intentionally, to um, the NAACP, for example. Um, this is an ongoing, uh, it's an ongoing thing, and do we do it as well as, as we could? Probably not, but, uh, but this is something that, that um, I think we're going to get better and better at. You, I think you addressed our next question, which is what is the role, if any, of media in the work of dismantling systemic barriers to engagement? So the, those outreach kind of programs that you were just talking about sounds like that addresses that as much as it can be within this context. Um, and then this, shifting a little bit, um, do you, let's see, um, we have a, a couple questions that focus around local influencers, mm -hmm. and so I'm just going to read through them. Uh, what does it actually mean to be an influencer within the context of Vermont civic issues? Is the media intended to be an influencer? If it is not, then how, how do you avoid bias in how you report on a story? Like, do you see yourselves apart, separate and apart from it, or as an influencer of it? Uh, apart from it. We don't intend, we don't have an agenda to influence an outcome. I, you know, I'd be naive to suggest that the media does not influence the outcome. Uh, just by giving voice to differing points of view, you'll have an influence. But it's not our in, in, mission to to try to engineer an outcome of, of, a, of a debate, of an election, uh, but to cover it fairly. So, uh, you know, influencer I typically associate with like, people talk about social media influencers who are paid to endorse products and, and be photographed with them, and I, I, I know nothing about that stuff. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, NBC bridges Vermont and northern New York, mm -hmm. so how do you navigate bringing together North Country viewers on topics that affect them, and are there cultural similarities or differences that make this easier or more challenging? And we have, we have two uh, counties in New Hampshire, um, oh, okay. in, the, in the Upper Valley, um, like the Dartmouth, from Dartmouth to Claremont, New Hampshire, those two counties. Counties in New Hampshire are huge. Counties in New York are huge. They're much, both are much larger than they are in Vermont. So we have, we have, three, we have three counties in, in northern New York, and we have two in western New Hampshire, and then we have 12 of the 14 in Vermont. Bennington and Wyndham. Wyndham's part of the Boston market, and Bennington's part of the Albany market. Um, I grew up in Bennington County, so I, I remember as a kid, 
we, you know, we watched Albany television. We weren't conscious of Burlington at all. I mean, everything was oriented toward Albany. So, uh, uh, but to your question, uh, how do you bridge? I mean, there are some issues that are quite um, common to uh, across our, our region, which is our, the Burlington Plattsburgh market, which is defined not by us, but by the FCC. Uh, it, it would take five or six hours to drive from one end to the other. Uh, it's, it's a vast area, uh, largely rural. There are, but there are commonalities um, to some degree. Uh, I don't want to uh, overstate that, but for example, the, the plight facing dairy farmers um, is very much the same. Um, the St. Albans Co-op, the milk co-op uh, in Franklin County, um, has a lot of supplying farmers in northern New York. They all face the same challenges with low milk prices and cost of production. Um, we share the weather. Uh, so, and the weather is very important um, to television stations and to television viewers. Um, but, you know, we do have different political systems. Um, Vermont is uh, more liberal than both New Hampshire and Northern New York. Um, so our politics uh, is different. Um, we share Lake Champlain. That would also be a commonality. I, I think there's universal concern about the health of, of Lake Champlain and uh, impacts of climate change and invasive species. And so there are some similarities, um, some common interests, but we have, a, we have a bureau in Plattsburgh, we have a bureau in, in Lebanon, New Hampshire, and then um, we're talking today from our main facility here in South Burlington. So we do have a question here about who is accessing the media market you work in and who is not. Yeah. Um, and I feel like that might be a generational thing as well, yeah, so maybe sure. you could speak to that. I mean, um, I'm sure, I'm sure there's data and, and, and specific statistical information that I don't have at the ready. But I would say in general, um, I think consumers of, you know, the evening broadcast, for example, have always tended to be older. I mean, I got interested in this business when my grandparents dragged me by the ear in front of the television and we watched John Chancellor uh, we were not Cronkite people, we were Chancellor people, um, you know, w watching back in the 70s. And that got me interested. I, th I think when I started, I was in my early 20s, right out of BVM, and, um, you know, I still think even then, uh, television news, radio newscasts, newspaper readers tended to be Older, older folks. So there's always been this disconnect, I think, between generations. Um, I think the internet and this, this, the, the new avenues of dissemination, like podcasts and websites, and certainly social media, Facebook. I think that younger people tend to gravitate toward those mediums. Um, I was at UVM in December, and. Uh, that's not true, I think it was in November. I was at UVM in November, speaking to a group of UVM seniors in a, in a reporting across media course. And the first question I asked them was, how many of you have, raise your hand, watched uh, a newscast in the last you know, month? And nobody raised their hand, nobody. So obviously I was <laughs> crestfallen, but not, not terribly surprised. And I asked, well, what do you want to do? Well. Um, I want to do podcasts. Do podcasts was the was the the answer I heard more most frequently. You know, when I started, we didn't have such a thing, so that was a wake up. Um, but I think I think generally news consumers tend to be you know forty and up, um, and uh, our challenge is of course to try to broaden that. Um, but I think that's just sort of the way it's been for a long time uh, and um, I'm not sure we're going to change that. I think younger viewers, younger 
consumers tend to be interested in different things. I mean, uh, it, it may be, and you'd have to get the data from the free press in seven days, but I'll, I'll, I'd be curious to know whether um, those who read their food columns and their arts and music columns tend to be younger. I would assume that's the case, but don't know. Yeah, I certainly do. Um... Yeah, it's interesting, the podcast scenario, because it's almost like your own radio show that might have been appealing to you at that age when you were at UVM. But who's listening? I mean, that's the thing. You're, are you only reaching people who are already interested in your topic? See, that's the opposite of what we do. A broadcast story goes out across our state instantly, um, not because you asked for it or because, you know, you you clicked on a button that said, I want a story about X. It, it, you know, it, it, it's a continuous linear newscast. And so it's really quite the opposite um, of, of a you know, on-demand uh, type of uh, product like a podcast. Totally, right. Yeah, um, this gets into the topic of a news desert. Um, we we're charged with um, trying to identify some places and people who might not be accessing the news. Um, we've touched on that a little bit. Um, so I want to I want to ask you: Is the news desert even a physical location, or does it differ based on demographic uh, or issue? And what does the term mean to you? Well, a desert to me is a desolate place um, that, in this context, would mean an area or a population that's unserved. Um, I, you, I, I think you're focusing on Chittenden County, right? Primarily, yeah. yeah, but also across Vermont, yeah. It's hard for me to see Chittenden County as a news desert, to be perfectly honest. I mean, we have a robust media climate here. That is not the case elsewhere in Vermont, uh, elsewhere in our country, but boy, we have a tradition of of engagement here that is that drives demand. We have three um, very active competing television stations. We have public access television, and we've we've had that for 30 years. We have a lot of community newspapers. Um, commercial radio news coverage uh, has declined, but VPR um, is uh, one of the country's uh, most listened to public radio stations, and we have an online presence. Um, the daily paper has declined, but the weekly paper has risen to the challenge. We have a lot, and, and we haven't even talked about social media. So, uh, no, I, I don't think that, uh, and, w and we have Front Porch Forum. I mean, it, nothing is more local than that. That'll tell you, you know, <laughs> you know who's missing their, their dog or cat uh, on the corner, on your corner. I mean, now it's hard to see this as a news desert. Um, let's see. Yeah, uh, what challenges do you see for media in Vermont in the current environment? Um, how has it changed over your time in the news? And are there any bright spots that you perceive? Um, Well, Vermont is, is a fairly small market. Uh, and so and at the moment, there's a lot of upward mobility in the news business. So people often work here for a time and then they leave and go to a larger city, larger state, unless you know, they fall in love with Vermont and decide to make this their home, which we hope they do. I think um, people of, of every political persuasion would agree. Uh, we need more people in our state. Um, but in the media business, you know, there uh, tends to be a, a churn, uh, a turnover. And that, that means we're retraining people over and over again. Um, so um, that is not new, but I think that it has um, it's gotten perhaps a little more pervasive. You can. There are a lot of things you can do in the world, and um, there are bigger markets that will hire you away. So that means that we have people who don't have long tenures. Uh, 
both covering news and, and also just being a citizen of our state. And, and, and that's not great, um, but it's the reality. And uh, so that's, that's one thing. I'm pretty encouraged though, because of civic engagement. We know we have higher than average voter participation and um, robust um, conversation uh, for the most part at, uh, uh, in, our, in our politics and you know, before our city councils and select boards. So um, I think we're gonna be fine, but uh, I think we're gonna be fine. Okay, yeah. Um, and just a couple questions here about sort of those, um, those kind of baseline questions we had touched on that we're interested in learning from each media maker like yourself. Um, who, how do you think people are learning the news um, and specifically learning about their neighborhoods, their own local neighborhoods in the news? You talked a little bit about Front Porch Forum. Yeah, I mean, I'll be clear. A television station, a Vermont statewide television station is not going to cover your neighborhood. Um, for the most part, um, uh, unless something bad happens, and then we'll be there. And that, and, and you know, you know what that means. It means, you know, if God forbid there's a terrible fire or a, a shooting uh, in your community, that attracts attention because it's rare, and that's what news represents. Uh, um, we don't cover the plane that landed safely. That's the cliche, but. There is um, a lot of opportunity to find out about your community through Front Porch Forum, which is a fabulous uh, free product uh, that I think it's in virtually every community in our state now. Uh, there um, are local newspapers that are, I mean, hyper-local newspapers, weeklies and stuff. You can volunteer or work for one of them if you are interested in, in getting involved. We just hired, um, a, gra a young UVM graduate who came to us after spending several months at the local paper in Waterbury, for example. You know, covering Waterbury. Not covering all the state, just Waterbury. So uh, there are, I think, and, and I think most towns in Chittenden County all have a paper like that. So uh, even my, my hometown of Winooski just restarted its paper. So there's a lot of opportunity um, to find out about your community and um, you know get engaged go and you don't have to go now you can just with a click watch your select board meeting once and you'll learn a lot about what's going on in your community absolutely um, and uh, th that's leads into um, you know what other non-traditional news sources exist and and how do you uh, partake in those as a more traditional media maker. What's the first part of the question? What other non-traditional news sources exist and how do you influence those as a media maker? I think we touched a little bit about social media and does NBC5 participate that, in that in any way? Sure, I mean we have a, NBC5 has a Facebook uh, channel and Instagram and Twitter accounts. I, I looked and our Facebook uh, page has 185,000 users. I couldn't, I was shocked, <laughs> but I checked ahead of this interview and um, that is by far our uh, top social media channel. Um, it's not as big as our website in terms of, you know, monthly page views, but uh, it's, a, it's a key driver of eyeballs to our brand. Um, that would be, uh, I guess, a non-traditional, to me, <laughs> it would be a non-traditional source. Um, uh, you know, there, uh, there is, uh, there's a lot that's on social media that's pretty dark and um, not true. And I think we have to be real careful about what we consume and believe. And, you know, I go back to my John Chancellor, Walter Cronkite days. I mean, you know, when we could all gather around and watch a common you know, newscast that you can have your opinions about what you saw and heard, but at least we can agree um, on the facts. And I think it was Senator Moynihan who once said, you know, you're entitled to your opinion, ma'am, but you're not entitled to your own set of facts. Uh, 
And I think that's something that traditional news, broadcast news, and, and mainstream news that is credible and doesn't have a, you know, an editorial bent you know, helps to foster a, a common understanding about um, the, what's going on um, in, our, in our state and in our country. Um, it's a good thing. Um, and I, I think our final baseline question is, what do you think people's primary news resource is? Or is there a primary news resource that you can identify? Well, I mean, the research will show that um, television news remains the number one source of information in our country. Um, that said, it's not as dominant at all uh, compared to what it was like in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Uh, there is a whole new landscape now that's driven by the internet. In Vermont, we have lots of um, news sources, information sources, and you know, so while television as a broadcaster still uh, has a big role to play, I, I think there are there are a lot of uh, choices. And I go back to something that you asked at the very beginning. I think you ought, ought to have multiple uh, avenues of information. And I think, you know, have a perspective, have a broad perspective and don't just watch and listen to, you know, something that you, you think you already agree with. Um, that's not really what news coverage is supposed to be. Um, if you like this and want to see more, watch the rest of the series. Thank you for watching and please vote.